Right, an official good morning to everybody in church this morning and also our viewers on YouTube, Bible School students, School of Holiness students, our partners, and uh, it's Father's Day. And I see a few fathers here in church, spiritual fathers as well, spiritual children, and uh, it's so awesome. This morning I want to talk to you about, and the title of the message is, Real End Time Fathers. Real End Time Fathers. People we're living in the end times. And things are getting more and more difficult for believers, especially for believers. For people in general, but especially for born-again believers. Real End Time Fathers. And our scripture reading Hebrews 1, verse 3 to 5. And I'm going to read out of the message translation. Hebrews 1, verse 3 to 5. This son perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with God's nature. He holds everything together by what he says, powerful words. After he finished the sacrifice for sins, the son took his honored place high in the heavens right alongside God, far higher than any angel in rank and rule. Did God ever say to an angel, you're my son, today I celebrate you? Or, I'm his father, he's my son. Our text verse, verse 3, Hebrews 1 verse 3 in the New International Version, the NIV. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. In the NIV we read about, it says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. People, Jesus Christ is coming back for a glorified bride. A purified bride. And we should be busy with that process of purification, of sanctification. You know, the moment that you give your heart to the Lord, the moment that you are born again, you are judged by God that very moment. By God, the judge of all judges. The judge of the universe. And the moment that you give your heart to the Lord, God declares you justified. He calls out, you are justified. That means that there is no punishment for sin anymore. Because Jesus paid the price. Then you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that is awesome. You are free from the penalty of sin. But then starts the next process. And that is the process of sanctification. The process of purification. And when you complete this process... Then you get to the third step, and that is glorification. Jesus Christ is coming back for a glorified bride. We should prepare ourselves. We are the bride. We should prepare ourselves through sanctification. Sanctification means freedom from the power of sin. Sin will lose more and more power as you are sanctified to the point of glorification to the point where Jesus comes for a glorified bride the church and when you are glorified 
when you are in the presence of Jesus Christ on that day, you will be free from the presence of sin. Isn't that awesome? Just think about it. No pain. No curses. No hardships. Nothing anymore. And that will happen when Jesus comes and we call that the rapture. And I believe the next big spiritual event in this world will be the rapture. The rapture of the church. And the Bible says it will be in the twinkle of an eye. So next Sunday morning, we will, I will preach on the rapture. And I will reveal some things that, that's so awesome about the rapture. Now you will also remember that next Saturday, the 24th of June, who of you know what is happening next Saturday? Aha. Uh -huh. It is our seminar, our spiritual counseling and prophetic seminar where Eugene Marais and Dr. Lynette Basson will minister to us. Don't miss it. If you did not register as yet, do so. Those of you watching on YouTube as well, do so. And Sunday, I will be preaching on the rapture. So, we've got a Father in heaven that is radiant, you know. The Bible talks about, if you go to the original language, the Shekinah glory of God. And we will see that. Now, in, on Father's Day, you know, I, I thought a lot about, in preparing for this sermon, about, you know, the end times that we're living in and challenges that we have as earthly fathers as well. So, God is the Father of Jesus Christ, and He has the nature and the character of God in Him, and so should we as well. And we are also children of God. Because of what Jesus did on Calvary for us. So, what is the perception of a father? You know, this morning, uh, Pastor Steph, sitting there behind the computer, his little son Ruben, he turned seven years old, uh, he turned seven on Thursday. Ne? And uh, I congratulated him this morning and uh, asked him, how old are you? And he said, no, he's seven. And I said, do you want to get as old as your father? He said, no, he's very, very old. He's 40. <laughs> so uh, what is the perception of a father? Now, they say that when you're four years old, you will say, my daddy can do anything. Seven years, my dad knows a lot, a whole lot. Eight years, my father doesn't quite know anything. Twelve years, oh well, naturally, father doesn't know everything. 14 years, father, hopelessly old-fashioned. 21 years, he's totally out of date. 25, he knows a little bit about it, but not too much. 30 years, I must find out what dad thinks about this. 35 years, let's get dad's meaning first. 50 years, what would dad have thought about this? 60 years, my dad knew literally everything. 65 years, if only I could talk it over with dad once more. And we are a society searching for the model father. You see, we've got a father problem in the world today. It's not a drug problem, or a crime problem, or this problem, or that problem. You know, I was in the police for 20 years, and we searched 
for the root of crime. But when I started to serve God, I realized that the root is within you. You see, God created a family. Family is an institution of God. And there's a father and a mother and children in a family. And even in a spiritual family as well, there's a spiritual father, spiritual mother, spiritual children. And uh, without us even knowing it, a lot of times that is actually the problem. I mean, Susanna, you just came back from Hungary and your, your dad passed away. Praise God you were there, uh, you know. Um, and I remember when he visited us in church, you know. And now it's the first Father's Day without him. And when one think about your father or somebody that really played that role in your life, you know, then you think of all the wisdom and the things that such a person taught you in life. But let me tell you, the real problem in this world is that this world is fatherless. So, if there's any shortage today, it is real fathers that take responsibility for their actions and take care of the financial, spiritual, and emotional well-being of their homes. Real fathers serve God. Real fathers are men of action. Real fathers prepare their children for adulthood. Real fathers take responsibility and real fathers are reliable. Real fathers are family men. You know, God chose me, an imperfect man like me, to, to play indispensable roles in the lives of our families, including our spiritual families. You don't have to be perfect to be a real father. Nobody is perfect. Everything we say today regarding father child relationships, I just want to make this point, also pertains to spiritual fathers and children as well. We read in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15, and I also want to read this in the message. Just look at this. You know, there are a lot of people around who can't wait to tell you what you've done wrong. But, say with me, but. Say it again, but. Now listen to this. There aren't many fathers willing to take the time and the effort to help you grow up. It was as Jesus helped me proclaim God's message to you that I became your father. You see, people, we've got a wrong idea of church. We've got a wrong idea of disciple-making. Who is your spiritual father? and or mother. We are serving a God of relationships. You know. And yes, this morning we are not too many in church. But a lot of you sitting here today, you know, I've got the honor to be your father and spiritual father. What an honor. You know. What a privilege. And that's why I always talk about God-ordained relationships. A lot of times, people just connect to people because that is what they like. But where's God in the picture? A God-ordained relationship is where God brings two people in a relationship with a specific purpose. And that is actually a covenant relationship. And we don't honor covenant anymore in the modern days that we live because we don't understand covenant. You see, our relationship should always be to the honor of God. 
And God always wants to impart into us through such relationships. And if we miss that, we miss church. <coughs> you see, there are no godly men who understand the role of a father according to God's word anymore. The devil succeeded to a great extent to break down the image of the godly father. And in doing so, he broke down the image of God the Father. Just think about it. Statistics show a society with an alarming trend toward deterioration of the family. Marriages are failing, parents are absent, and relationships are not important anymore. The family unit has been torn apart, leaving the children unprotected and drifting. Husbands and fathers are absent, and this leads to destruction and disorder all around us. And now we want to solve the problem. But you can do whatever you want. You will never solve the problem if you don't get to the root of the problem. Then you're just treating the symptoms. It's time for restoration. Well, it's, time is running out. Let me put it that way. There's, 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 there's not much time left for restoration. This is very, very urgent. You see, God wants to bring about restoration in one of the most important God-ordained relationships on this earth. The relationship between fathers and their children. We're living in the last days. There's no more time left. What I'm saying now is also supposed to be a fulfillment of the Lord's promise in the last days. Let's go to Malachi 4, verse 5 to 6, and I'm going to read out of the Amplified. Malachi 4, verse 5 to 6. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. A reconciliation produced by repentance. So that I will not come and strike the land with a curse of complete destruction. You see people, because we don't honor our covenant relationships anymore. It causes havoc on this earth. God wants to restore harmony among fathers and their children, both naturally and spiritually, so that fathers can freely impart their godly inheritance to the next generation. Who of you know that generational curses are not the will of God, but generational blessings? That is the heart of God. You know, when God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, before the fall of man, when you go, you can read uh, in Genesis 1 from verse 26 to 28, there you will see what God did. Created Adam and Eve, His children. And He... Bless them. I can see the picture. I can see the picture. The blessing always goes with words spoken. But I can see how God stands and He lays His hands on His children. And He blessed them and said to them, Multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. That's the blessing. So a buzzword these days is generational curses or bloodline curses. But do of you know that God speaks about 600 times, plus minus 600 times in the Bible of blessings and about 200 times of curses because God's will is to bless. And that is what a father should do as well. To impart the blessing. Don't curse your children. 
Don't tell your child when you when he did something wrong. Hey, he's stupid. He's too gezip, young. Don't do that. <laughs> Bless your child. Speak the word of God. There's one thing that God cannot do. God cannot lie. His word is the truth. If there's so much power in your words, how much more in the word of God? Bless. Follow God's example. You know, he said about his own son, Jesus Christ, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Bless your child. Bless your spiritual children. Speak blessings. And that is impartation. Who of you can tell me what is the, what is the purpose of being blessed? Why is it that God wants to bless us? Who can tell me? What is the purpose of being blessed? Say again, Christian. Exactly. Thank you. We are blessed to be a blessing. So you see, if your father bless you, and you are blessed, you are empowered to bless. Can you see the power in this? Can you see the will of God in this? Godly inheritance to the next generation. And so that the children can receive the God-given inheritance and develop into the God-given purpose. So let's look at God-ordained fathers. You see, let me tell you something. A man can be a man without a wife. But a man cannot be a husband and a father without a wife and a mother. Let me repeat this. Think about this. A man can be a man without a wife. But a man cannot be a husband and a father without a wife and a mother. Fathers and family is God's idea. We read in Genesis, God created Adam and Eve. Or is it Adam and Steve? No, no. Adam and Eve. Is that right? Or is it Madam and Eve? No, no. The word says Adam and Eve. And then we read, male and female he created them. And then he blessed them. You see, that is what God blessed. Husband and wife, family, according to his word. And the word of God says that a house divided against itself shall not stand. You see, God is not divided against himself. A man can be a man without a wife, but a man cannot be a husband and a father without a wife and a mother. So fathers and family, as I said, is God's idea. It is God ordained and God designed. God is the father of all born again believers in Christ Jesus. We read in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 18. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters says the Lord God Almighty. You see, a husband and father can only be a God-ordained husband and father when he is standing in the right relationship with God the Father in Christ Jesus. You see, then you don't have to perform to be good enough. Because then the power and the love and the light and the life of God flows through you, the truth of God. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit living within you. We must follow Jesus' example. The Bible tells us about fatherhood. We see that fathers are representatives of Jesus Christ. Christ portrayed fatherhood to us. We can also look at a father's or at a father as having three roles that we read about in the Bible. 
And each of them is also the roles of Jesus Christ. Every father should be a priest, a king, and a prophet. Say with me, priest, king, and prophet. In his own household. So let's look at priest in his own household. In short, it means uh, where there's a priest, there must be a sacrifice. We must again follow Christ's example and allow our priestly sacrifice to be our very selves. In so doing, you will love your wife as Christ loved the church. Listen, people. We read in Ephesians 5 about the relationships. First of all, husband and wife. Then we read about children and parents, family. And then we even read about employer and employee, isn't it? You can read from verse, I think it is verse 22, talking about husband and wife. But who of you know what stands in verse 21? You see, the Holy Spirit once said to me, you cannot read the rest before you read verse 21. Verse 21 says, Ephesians 5 verse 21 says, that we must submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You cannot continue if you don't read that verse. Yeah, pastor, you know what? I'm the boss. I'm the head of my house. No, you're not the boss. You've got a role to play as the head of the house, but you're not the boss. You are accountable towards God. And God also says that a wife must submit to her own husband, not another husband, her own husband. Submit to your own husband. But once again, do it out of reverence for Christ. Children, you must honor your father and mother. And fathers, don't provoke your children. Employers, employees, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so doing, priest, priest of your house, you will love your wife as Christ loved the church. We are here to serve, fathers, you are there in your house, in your family to serve. We will serve our wives, our children, our spiritual children as priests, following the example of Christ. Representing our family to God and God to our family. What does it mean to be king in his house? King to rule his family in the fear of God. Say that word with me, fear. We'll touch on that word again. King to rule his family in the fear of God. Let us declare what Joshua said in Joshua 24 verse 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <coughs> We as husbands and fathers must lead. We must lead clearly and boldly. We must provide for our family and we must protect our family. The privilege is ours to rule our home. However, we are not called to dominate our wives and children. We must rule as Christ rules. With humility, we must have the fear of God in us. <clears throat> prophet of his house. What does that mean? Prophet to teach and instruct his family. The father praying with his family will teach them how to pray. <clears throat> he must prophesy over his wife and children and his spiritual children. How? By declaring and speaking the word 
and promises of God over them, speaking the God-ordained future into existence, declaring life and the blessings of God over them. Without the word of God, a prophet has nothing to say, no ground to stand on. His words are empty and meaningless. So speak the word. Follow the example of Jesus and live the word. <coughs> now I want to touch on something before we close this service. I want to touch on something that is of the utmost importance in the days that we live. And I want you to understand this. And it might sound very negative now, but we need to take note of this, people. You know, the title of this message I said to you is Real End Time Fathers. We are living in the end times. I would say the end of the end times. There's no time left anymore. <coughs> what is happening in our days, in these last days that we're living in? Let us just have a brief look at the state of our world. Who of you know what happened in South Africa past week, two weeks, about a certain uh, retailer, a shop? Aha, uh -huh, there's the buzzword, Woolworths. And uh, there's a lady, Afrikaans-speaking lady, that she's got a ministry as well, Greta Witz, some of you will know her. And she commented on this, but very professional in a godly way with the love of God. And you know, I was shocked about what other so-called Christians answered and what they said to her. You know. Another thing is uh, a food outlet. Let me give you another clue. A food outlet. KFC, busy with the Diablo burger, that demonic burger, and you can even connect to a, dem a, a demonic or a demon game. It's in the order of the day. It's happening all around us. So children, please, don't play that game or don't even order that burger. It will not be good for you. You see, the spirit of Antichrist is at work. He wants to control the world, preparing for the great tribulation. So that is why next Sunday we will look at the, at the rapture. It's very important that we understand this. So that's the world around us. I can continue. If I, if I say the, the word Bella, who of you know who or what is Bella? Is it Bella Bella? <laughs> I think, uh, Karin, we must go to Bella Bella. But this is not Bella Bella. It's not warm baths. This is the Bella Act, where they want to take control of our children in a demonic way. Oh, I can continue this a lot more, you know. You see, our world is in a mess. So why are we in such a mess? Why are our family in such a mess? Our families. Because of sin. And the sin of our ancestors. And the sin that we are doing. Let's go to Exodus 20 verse 5 to 6. And I'm going to read out of the message. <coughs> no carved gods of any size, shape or form. Of anything whatever whether of things that fly or walk or swim. Don't bow down to them and don't serve them because I am God, your God. I'm a most jealous God. Punishing the children for any sins their parents pass on to them to the third and yes, even to the fourth generation of those who hate me. But, this is our God. This is our God of love. But I'm unswervingly 
loyal to the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. You see, our fathers sinned. And we sinned and are still sinning. And a lot of these sins came in through the bloodline. But now it's a step further even. You see, it went from sin to transgression to iniquity. Sin is sin. But when you sin and you're a born again believer and the, the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin and you repent and you stop it, that's good. But when you willingly, knowingly continue with it, you're starting to transgress. You don't care anymore. You're in rebellion. And then when it becomes a habit, it's an iniquity. And then it's a lifestyle. And it, become, it, it be, became acceptable to us. <coughs> yes, we are going to church. We are busy with religion. But God is not in the picture. Became acceptable to us. We are now becoming more and more arrogant in the days that we're living. Even in the modern day church. The fear of God is gone. It's not there anymore. We don't stand up for what is right anymore. So what is the fear of God? Let me show you. One of the meanings of the fear of God. Proverbs 8 verse 13. Proverbs 8 verse 13. Let's read that. The fear of the Lord is to... To what? Hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Now listen to this. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. You see, the things that, that, that Wilbur's proclaim and KFC and all this and all that, oh no, God will understand. He's a God of grace. He loves us. Listen, where's the fear of God? God hates evil. If we love evil, it means that the fear of God departed. And that's the problem in the church. The fear of God isn't there anymore. And that's the problem in our households, in our marriages, with our children. The fear of God isn't there anymore. We don't hate evil anymore. We compromise. We are busy with transgressions and with iniquity. In the world that we live today, we don't hate evil. We are compromising the Word of God, the way that it suits us. God is not in the picture anymore. We became a sinful nation. And the men and the fathers of this nation does not want to take responsibility anymore. That's the problem. Isaiah 1 verse 4 in the NIV says, Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of, a, a brood of evil doers, children given to corruption. Listen, we gave our children to corruption. And our ancestors gave us to corruption. That is where we are. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Our nation. You see, and that is the problem now. Now it is not only affecting individuals. It's affecting the whole nation. It is now a national iniquity. It is now a land curse, if you want to. We are perverted and corrupt. It is a state of national iniquity. Sins such as abortion, same-sex marriages, idolatry, and a lot more, you can name it, are legalized. 
And we as a whole nation is involved. Do we really realize what the situation is in South Africa and where we are? Without national repentance, there will be national calamity. And that is what's starting to happen all around us. The judgment of God is moving. But praise God, the grace of God is there still. People. And now you can, you can say to me, oh, but you know, I did not vote for this government. We instituted these laws. I ask for who did you vote? That you make sure that the party that you voted for, what their constitution says. There are, there were, in the previous election, there were only three parties, only three that stood for 100% biblical principles, who said yes to Jesus in South Africa. Only three. All the other said yes to abortion. Same-sex marriages. No, Jesus, we don't want you part of our constitution. We don't want you in our country. We don't want you in our schools. Go. And now we want to ask, where is God? I had to repent, well, a few years ago. God will, he will hold us accountable. It's time to repent. It is time to get serious about God. It's time for the men and the fathers to stand up and to put our trust in God and to make sure that our marriages, our families, our churches, our communities knows exactly what the Word of God says, and that we start to live a living relationship with God and not religion. It's time for the fear of God to come back into our lives. Our time is running out. Without national repentance, there will be national calamity. The judgment of God is moving. But this judgment is a judgment of love. But it is nearly the end. You see, in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, God says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. We know that. Our time is running out. We are in the last of the last days. You know, in Acts 17 verse 30, and I'm just going to read this out of the Passion Translation. Listen to this. In the past, God tolerated our ignorance of these things. But now the time <coughs> of deception has passed away. He commands us all to repent and to turn to God. What are we as fathers going to do from here on? We can make the difference. God is involved in our lives because He loves us people. His grace is still available and still enough. And I'm not talking about cheap grace. I'm talking about His real grace. Even if your father is gone, Susanna, like your father, even if your father is gone, even if you didn't have the relationship with your father that you would have wanted, <coughs> you can take comfort in the fact and the truth that God is your father. Real fathers demonstrate love. Real fathers train and discipline. Real fathers provide, real fathers reproduce, real fathers bless and impart, real fathers are available, real fathers give identity 
security, value, and destiny. And real fathers see the potential. A real father is a God-ordained family man. We need real end-time fathers, empowered by God. Let us take responsibility and stand in Christ. We read in Joshua 24, verse 15. And let us, let's proclaim that. Say this with me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Right. I'm going to ask Pastor Karin. She wants to come and say something to the fathers and maybe Pastor Hannes as well. And I don't know with Jan and whoever. And Pastor Steph as well. I don't know. Anyway, over to you. Can we pray over these men? And I want to ask the wives to lay your hands on your husbands and really dedicate to God to them. <coughs> Father God, in the almighty name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, we bow before you today. Lord, we give you recognition for the highest force that ever was and will be. Lord, but we also praise your holy name that you have purposed every man. That you have put them in a leadership role, Father God. But Lord, they need you. They need the strength of the Spirit within, Father God. And today is our prayer that you will strengthen every man, Father. Not just the people serving God, but Lord, also those who do not know you. Lord, send your sweet Spirit to go and fill those void places that they experience. Lord, today we bring before you a broken nation that lacks of leaders, Father God, because they do not have the identity of Christ in them. And I ask that you will give them revelation knowledge of the fullness of the Christ in us. Thank you for precious strong leaders, Father God. And Lord, today I dedicate my own husband to you. And I thank you, Father God, for the God you made in my life. Someone that can take the lead and that is always willing to help. Lord, the sacrifices that he makes, a lot of people don't see it, but you do. And therefore, I honor him today, Father God. And I honor you, Father, for my soulmate. And Lord, thank you that we can just stand here and appreciate one another today. Bless this congregation, Father God, and bless every man as they leave this place today, Father, that they will know that God is the one that will be followed and nothing will go wrong. We pray shall we name for you are God Almighty. Amen. So um, yes, I just want to today as well, uh, just on behalf of the congregation and on behalf of uh, um, me as a son, a spiritual son and a son to Pastor Michael, um, we just want to come today and we want to also just give him something. But before I do that, the Bible actually says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And um, you know, what is a good man? A good man is a man who serves God. A good man is a man who loves God. A good man is a man who is willing to give everything and anything that he has and all that he has for God. And I can say to you, having known Pastor Michael most of my life, I can say to you today that that is the type of man that Pastor Michael is. He's a good man. And then the Bible says that good man also leaves an inheritance to his children's children. You know, I've seen what Pastor Michael means in my life. I've seen what he means in my son's life. And not just me and my son, but the many sons that he has, you know, there's many people that's not here today that is his sons in the Lord. There's many people here today, not here today, that, that he has been a, a father to, to the, to the fathers. And, you know, I've, I've seen that heritage that he leaves, you know, that heritage that I'm talking about is a heritage of faith. It's not just something that he talks, it's something that he walks. You know, through every season of life, through every difficulty, every trial, he's always walked the walk, um, the walk, and he's always served God. So, 
so we just want to say as a congregation and as, as spiritual sons and I believe spiritual daughters as well, we want to say today, Pastor Michael, we love you. We appreciate you. You are very, 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 very special. And we thank God that you are here with us and we love you very much. Amen. I just want to thank you. There is something special for Pastor Michael. And we're going to just ask him to just please pray over Pastor Michael. Amen. Father, we thank you that we as a church and as sons can pray for Pastor Michael this morning, Lord. Thank you, Father, for a father. Father, thank you, Lord, for his heart, Lord, um, that, he, that he just lives out every single day. Father, thank you for, for putting him in our lives. Lord, we are so blessed to have him in our lives, Father. And we thank you that you just pick him up this, this morning, pick him up today, Lord. Lord, we thank you that his heart's desires, Father God, that you will that you will provide it for him, Lord, that you will give it to him this year, Father. Lord, he's a blessing for us, Lord. And Father, we just want to pray, Holy Spirit, that you will touch him. Lord, there's so much things that we can and want to do, but we know his heart is that he would want more of you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you will give him the wisdom, the insight, Father, the revelation, Lord, that he needs, Lord, to pave the way, Father. And we thank you that we can just cover him tonight, but this morning, Lord, in the blood of Jesus, Lord, again afresh. We thank you that you multiply him this morning, Lord, in 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 his um, in his spirit in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you surround him to this morning, that you lift him up in the mighty name of Jesus, Father. And we thank you that his hands, his work is blessed, Lord. We thank you, Father, we can see the fruit, Lord. And we thank you for the harvest that's coming in Jesus' name. And we give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Pastor Michael, um, you know, you're so special to me. Um, you are my spiritual father. And I'm so grateful for, for everything that you've done for me and that you always stand in the gap for me. Mm. I thank you for your knowledge. I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you for always imparting into me. And I'm ever grateful. Um, you are very one, one very special man um, in my life. And I'm very proud of you. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful today. Amen. Lord, that we can celebrate fathers this morning. Father, I just want to lay Pastor Michael before your feet this morning. And I thank you, Lord, that you always strengthen him. Thank you that you always guide him. Thank you, Father, that you've given him a heart mm. for people, Lord. Thank you that you've given him a heart for those around him, Father, that he puts others before himself. And we just thank you for that, Father. We give you all the glory for the man that you've made him, Father, for the example that he is to every congregation member, to every person that he meets. Thank you, Father, that he leaves a legacy of Christ wherever he goes. And we give you the glory, Father. Amen. Thank you that he is a father, Lord, to those who need a father. Father, we thank you for the work that he does in the Bible school. We thank you for the work that he does in the school of wholeness. We thank you for the work that he does in this community, Father. And Lord, for the part that you've brought him and the people that he's connected with, Father, thank you that he leaves a legacy of Christ wherever he goes. And we thank you, Father, that you strengthen him day by day by day. Amen. Father, thank you for this ministry. Thank you for this church. And Father, thank you for the footprint that he has globally, Lord, not just in front of our park but for the work that he does that is seen globally, Father. Thank you that you bless him and continue to bless him, Lord, in this journey. And Father, we give you all the glory, Amen. the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Okay. Okay, you guys, so we drew to the end of the service. And...
may you enjoy the stay and <coughs> always know that you are very, very valuable in the eyes of the Lord. Never underestimate your value and just know that we all love you and we care for you. Thank you for who you are in our lives and we praise God for everyone in this house. May you be blessed and have a wonderful day. Oh.